Uh, thanks for the introduction, Kelly. Hey, everyone. So I'm George Chen. I'm the product marketing manager at MPS, who's responsible for the isolated and high power products. And today we'll be discussing the MPS DC fast charging station solutions. Um, so I'll go over a quick agenda for today. So we'll take a look at uh, an overview of charging infrastructure. We'll take a look at a DC fast charging station block diagram. Um, then we'll go through some of the MPS solutions for this charging infrastructure. And then lastly, I'll be discussing um, a design for resonant LLC power supply, and then I'll finish it up with a conclusion. So if we look at uh, an overview of EV charging infrastructure today, uh, there's three different levels that we generally see. There's L1 and L2, which is stations that provide AC power to charge an electric vehicle. And generally this could take anywhere from eight plus hours uh, to fully charge a battery electric vehicle. When we talk about L1 charger, that usually means it charges at three kilowatts or less. So it charges about three to 10 miles for every hour of charging. Uh, while L2 chargers are slightly more powerful, so they're rated for anywhere from three kilowatts up to 22 kilowatts, which is about nine to 60 miles of range per hour off of AC power. The last category is a DC fast charger. Uh, these charging stations can actually charge an EV battery from 10 to 90 percent within 18 minutes or so uh, for the fastest ones. And so depending on the power rating, uh, generally we see the power ratings today anywhere from being anywhere between 50 kilowatts up to 400 kilowatts of power. Um, that kind of manages how quickly uh, the EV will actually end up charging at. So here's an overview of all the plugs that we see used globally. In the China market, uh, they use the GBT standard, while CCS1 and CCS2 are fairly popular in Europe and North America, as well as South Korea uh, for DC fast charging. If we look at CCS1 or CCS2, um, they actually have a very similar plug for the AC charging, uh, with the Menekadis plug being used for the AC charging in Europe, and then the J1772 plug uh, being used in North America, South Korea, and Japan. So in order to achieve the CCS1 or CCS2 DC fast charging speeds, um, based off the AC plugs, you basically just have two uh, large wires added for power delivery. And then for fast charging in Japan, uh, Chatamo is the most common standard. Uh, Tesla does tend to have its own connector for both AC and DC charging in all markets, except for Europe. Um, and in Europe in particular, Tesla uses the CCS2 plug for DC fast charging. So now we'll take a quick look at a block diagram for a DC fast charging station. Um, so this block diagram shows the conversion from a three phase AC voltage into a 250 volt or 800 volt DC voltage that's used to charge an electric vehicle. Um, so a DC fast charging station actually typically contains several of these subunits. Um, so each of these subunits might be anywhere from 30 kilowatts up to about 75 kilowatts of power. And then you would basically just parallel these subunits together to achieve uh, 250 kilowatts or even 350 kilowatts, for example. Generally, these DC fast charging stations are generally comprised of two conversion stages. So the first stage we have is a power factor correction stage, uh, and that helps convert the AC voltage from the power grid into an intermediate DC voltage bus somewhere between 800 volts up to 1300 volts. Um, a three-phase, three-level rectifier or inverter topology is pretty com common uh, for this PFC stage. And then this particular topology actually refers to a three-level converter that can interface with a three-phase power grid. The next stage uh, we have is a DC-DC stage uh, where an isolated DC-DC converts the intermediate DC voltage uh, to the target voltage that's specified uh, by the battery being charged. And so for most EVs today, that's typically around either 400 volts or even 800 volts. Here we usually use an LLC and, and a phase shift full bridge uh, converter uh, for the DC-DC stage. Um, so if you look at some of the products that are offered by MPS, we have products such as isolated gate drivers, uh, gate driver power supplies, isolated power modules with integrated transformers, um, and then current sensors uh, for these DC fast charging stations. And some of the biggest challenges we see today are really maximizing power density and reducing cost and reducing size uh, for these designs. So if we look at uh, MPS, MPS is heavily investing into electrification as well as green energy products. Uh, we have many products that are compatible with both silicon carbide MOSFETs as well as IGBTs. And we continue to create uh, innovative and integrated solutions that can really help reduce the total component count and lower the solution cost. Um, 
a lot of the products we have today are, can be used for both 400 volt as well as 800 volt architectures with our proprietary uh, MPS BCD process. And today uh, we do have over 800 automotive products and we have over 12 years of experience in the automotive industry. And we've actually shipped more than 2 billion units um, of automotive components today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if you look at our uh, quality record, we do have an industry leading quality record with a 0 0.06 DPPM for automotive products. And our products are designed to help systems run cooler with higher performance and integration. And if you look at the isolated products that I'll be presenting today, um, all of the MPS isolated products do use capacitive isolation technology. So this is a quick overview of the main markets uh, that MPS is focused on, especially on the automotive side. So um, of course we have DC fast charging stations, energy infrastructure, and then within vehicles, we have onboard DC, DC, onboard chargers and traction inverters. And then we also have a focus on 48 volt DC, DC, as well as belt start generators. If you do look at the products uh, from MPS, um, we do meet various isolation requirements from two and a half KV to three KV, and even up to 5 kV reinforced isolation. Um, for some of our switching power supplies or gate driver power supplies, we do have the ability to switch up to 10 megahertz, which can really help reduce the uh, total solution size. Uh, we are completely certified with UL certification as well as VDE with our products. And then the different products we have include isolated gate drivers, isolated power modules with integrated transformers. Uh, we have a half bridge GAN driver, digital signal isolators, as well as isolated amplifiers. So here's a quick look at our roadmap for digital isolators and power supplies. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have some of our isolated, uh, digital isolator power supplies. These are all uh, easy to use um, five volt or three volt input power modules with an integrated transformer. Um, so these are really great for auxiliary power supplies um, and we take care of the transformer design for you. So we have different versions um, that scale from one watt down to 0 0.2 watts, and they can either take a five volt input um, or a 3.3 volt input and provide either five volt or 3.3 volt output. And these are all available in a small SYC 16 wide body package. On the right hand side, uh, we have our family of uh, digital isolators. Um, so our digital isolators are the MP279XX family. Uh, the last two digits actually stands for the number of forward or reverse channels. So the MP27933 is a three, four channel, three reverse channel, uh, six channel digital isolator. All of these digital isolators that are either four or six channels um, are available in an SOIC 16 wide body package. So it is pin spin compatible uh, with many of the other suppliers out there if you are looking to increase the robustness of your supply chain. If we take a deeper dive into the MID 1W0505A uh, isolated power module family, uh, we see that the input voltage range for this device is anywhere from 3 volts to 3.6 volts or 4.5 to 5.5 volts. These are really optimized for either a 3.3 volt or a 5 volt input. Uh, we do have excellent load transient performance and regulation of 0.5% and then line regulation of 1.5%. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this is a scalable family from 0 0.25 watts up to about one watt of power. And we do have some protection features such as short circuit protection, overcurrent protection, as well as over temperature protection. And we are able to meet uh, CISPR 32 class B EMI requirements with this device. Uh, we generally see this as a power supply for digital isolators or any other sort of small sensors you might have on your board. Uh, so the next device here, this is the MP279XX digital isolator family. Uh, we do have a pin-to-pin compatible automotive grade variant as well. So for the automotive grade, uh, you'd just be looking at the MPQ279XX. The input voltage range of this device is 2.5 to 5.5 volts. Uh, we do have data rates up to 150 megabits per second, and then we have a 20 megabit per second option as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this family is either four channels or six channels. And the XX in the name of the product is basically just the number of forward and reverse channels uh, that you need. If we look at the block diagram on the right hand side here, uh, we show the isolated power module with integrated transformer uh, biasing the digital isolator. Um, and then we just have the digital isolator with uh, you know, up to three input channels and three uh, reverse channels here. Uh, we do have a good common mode transient immunity spec of 100 kilovolts per microsecond. 
And for this device, uh, we do have 5 kV isolation or 2.5 kV isolation uh, available. And this is all available in an SOIC 16 wide body package that is pin to pin compatible with many of the competitors in the market. So next we'll take a quick look at our roadmap for isolated gate drivers and then the gate driver power supplies. Uh, so on the left-hand side here, uh, the MPQ18913 is a uh, five megahertz LLC um, transformer driver power supply. Uh, so this can be used to bias either silicon carbide or IGBTs for your plus 15 minus eight volt or maybe plus 15 minus three or four volts. Um, on the right-hand side, we do have two power modules that are based off this MPQ18913. Uh, so the MID1W2424 is a one watt or two watt power module. Uh, this device has a one to one turns ratio transformer. So if you provide 24 volts on the input, we can provide 24 volts on the output. And again, this, this power module does have an integrated transformer and this is available in an SOIC 16 wide body package. Um, below that, we have the MID6W2424. Uh, so that's either a three watt or a six watt power module. Um, we can achieve up to 5 kV isolation with this module. And again, um, we have versions that are 1 to 1 turns ratio transformer, 1 to 1.6, and then 1 to 1.2. The way we actually name these power modules um, is for the power modules with integrated transformers, you're looking for an MID part number on the front end. Uh, the next two digits, the 1W or 6W, uh, talks about the power level. Uh, so 1W is 1 watt, 6W is 6 watts. The 3 watt version is the MID 3W. And then the 2424 talks to the input voltage and output voltage. And so that basically gives you an idea of what the uh, transformer turns ratio is on the inside of this power module. On the right hand side here, uh, we have our single channel as well as dual channel isolated gate drivers. Uh, so the MP18811 or MPQ18811 is in an SOIC8 narrow body package. Um, for these gate drivers, again, uh, these are pin to pin compatible with many of the competitors out there. Um, so if you're looking for second source solutions to help increase the robustness of your supply chain, uh, these are great products to take a look at. Um, the MPQ18831, 51, and 71 are a dual channel gate driver family that offers either a dual input half bridge, dual independent inputs, or even a PWM input half bridge. Uh, so the first device we have here, this is the MPQ18811 isolated single channel gate driver. Uh, so we do have an SOIC narrow body as well as wide body package available. So for the wide body package, we can achieve a 5 kV isolation spec. And for the narrow body package, we can achieve a 3 kV isolation spec. Uh, we do have several different uh, UVL options from 5 volts all the way up to 15 volts. And then we do have um, a version for either single output with Miller clamp or even a split output version as well. Uh, for the automotive grade device, uh, we can achieve 6 amp source and 10 amp sync peak current. And then for the non-automotive device, uh, we have a four amp source current, uh, source current spec and four amp sync peak current spec. The propagation delay for this device is about 50 nanoseconds typical. Um, and then if you do need the AEC Q100 qualified version, we do have the MPQ18811 available. And this is just your standard uh, gate driver that can be used for driving either silicon carbide or IGBTs. Uh, the next products we have, this is the MPQ18831, 51, and 71 family. Uh, so this is our family of isolated dual channel gate drivers. Um, as I mentioned before, the 31 is a dual input half bridge that has dead time control. Uh, the 51 is dual independent drivers. And then the 71 is the PWM input half bridge. Uh, we do offer isolation up to 5 kV, depending on which package you choose. Um, again, we have uh, several different UVL options from 5 volts all the way up to 15. Um, the source and sync peak current spec for this device is 4 amp source and 8 amp sync. And then uh, th we have four different packages available, either a narrow body SYC16, wide body SYC16, a 5x5 five five LGA, and then a wide body SYC14 package um, that actually has a couple pins removed to have increased creepage. Uh, so with this package, we can actually achieve 3.3 millimeter creepage. And again, all these devices have an operating junction temperature from negative 40 C up to about 150 C. So this slide kind of goes through the different isolation voltage ratings that you can achieve with different packages. Uh, so for the first two, either the SOIC 16 or SOIC 14 wide body package, we can achieve an isolation rating of 5 kV RMS. 
Uh, for the SOIC 60 narrow body package, we can achieve 3K VRMS. And then for the LGA uh, package, um, that can achieve a 2.5K VRMS rating. Uh, so the device I'm showing here, this is the MID 3W or 6W 2424. Uh, so this is a 24 volt isolated power module with an integrated transformer. So for any sort of designs that you need for biasing silicon carbide, uh, we can provide a plus 20, minus four volts uh, differential supply, or even plus 15 and minus eight for IGBTs. We are able to achieve a 87% peak efficiency with this power module. Uh, we do have three different turns ratios available. So uh, the MID 3W and 6W 1224 is a one to two turns ratio. We have the 1524, which is a one to 1 1.6 turns ratio on the input. And then we have the 2424, uh, which is a one to one turns ratio. So these three variants are actually really optimized for either a 12 volt input, 15 or 24 volt input uh, to provide a differential 24 volt output uh, as a gate driver power supply. We are able to achieve 5 kV RMS isolation on this. And then the operating temperature for this device is negative 40 C to 105 C. Uh, we do have samples of this device available today. Uh, we are planning on going into production about April or May timeframe uh, for this device. Um, and we've seen a lot of traction with uh, this device, especially in DC fast charging stations as a silicon carbide or IGBT gate driver power supply. Uh, you can take a look at the output regulation here. Uh, we're, at, we're right around uh, plus or minus one and a half percent for a 24 volt input and trying to regulate about 24 volts. And then on the right hand side, we have our efficiency versus the output load. Uh, so at full load at 100 milliamps, uh, we're pretty close to about 87% efficiency uh, with this power module. The next device we have here, this is the MPQ18913. Uh, this is a 30 volt half amp LLC transformer driver for isolated bias supply. Uh, so this is actually an LLC topology. Uh, we generally see this competing against flybacks. And uh, we see LLC becoming more and more popular as uh, bus voltages have been going higher and higher. Um, so we've seen the evolution from 400 volts up to 800 volts. And in order to really minimize the interwinding capacitance, um, an LLC solution is a great way to do that. Uh, so we do have two different versions of this IC. The 18913 uh, can go up to 5 megahertz switching frequency. Uh, we also have the 18914, which can go up to 10 megahertz switching frequency. Uh, this device does have automatic resonant frequency detection. Uh, so on startup of your circuit, um, this device can automatically detect the resonant frequency uh, to make sure that you're operating with zero voltage switching. And then we do have optional spread spectrum in this device for EMI reduction as well. We have a number of protection features, including overcurrent, short circuit, over voltage, and over temperature protection. And we do have a fault reporting pin, this FLT pin, um, in case there is any sort of error condition. Generally, this device can support up to about six watts of power total, and this is available in a tiny QFN10 two by two and a half millimeter package. Uh, we generally tend to see this in either as an IGBT or silicon carbide gate driver bias. Um, this can be popular for DC fast charging stations and then um, in the vehicle for EV traction inverters and onboard chargers as well. Uh, so here's a quick look at the evaluation board uh, that we have for the MPQ18913. Uh, the evaluation board that we're showing here actually has a planar transformer. So you can see that some of the windings are directly on the PCB to help decrease the total solution size. Uh, we do have another EVB um, that has a traditional bobbin transformer as well, uh, if, you, if you aren't so familiar with using planar transformers. And then on the right-hand side, uh, we have our load current versus efficiency. So operating with a 24-volt input to 24-volt output at 1.33 megahertz, uh, we're able to achieve a peak efficiency right around uh, 85%, um, and then about 87.5% uh, for peak efficiency of this device. Another power module we have available is the MID1W2424. Uh, so this device is actually optimized for up to about 1.5 watts of power. We have an input voltage range of 5 to 30 volts with transients up to 50 volts. Again, we'll have uh, versions for either 3 kV RMS or 5 kV RMS isolation. This does come with just a one-to-one -one turns ratio transformer, and we're estimating about 60% efficiency at full load with this device. Um, as you can see, because of this LLC topology, we actually have a very, very low isolation capacitance of only eight picofarads. Um, and the main difference between this 
power module versus the three watt and six watt is this one watt module can actually be AECQ 100 qualified. And so it does have a wider temperature operating range uh, from negative 40 C up to 125 C. And this is in a very small SYC 16 wide body package. Um, so if you're really space constrained in the Z dimension, uh, this is a great device to look at. The total height of this SYC 16 wide body package is about 2.65 millimeters. Um, you can imagine if you use a flyback um, or even a discrete solution, generally the transformer can be as tall as eight or nine millimeters. Uh, so the 2.65 millimeter height of this MID1W 2424 uh, is one of the great features that we have. And again, uh, these power supplies are all really optimized for as an IGBT or silicon carbide gate drivers, drivers bias uh, with plus 15 minus four volts or plus 15 minus eight volts. Uh, DC fast charging stations can also use solutions like this as well as traction inverters and onboard chargers. So next we'll uh, take a deeper look at these isolated bias supplies and why you might be interested in these LLC topologies versus a flyback. Um, so first, we have a PCB footprint analysis of an isolated bias supply. So on the left-hand side, uh, we're using the discrete solution, the MPQ18913, which is our 5 megahertz LLC bias supply. Um, due to the high switching frequency, we can achieve a much smaller transformer size. So here, the transformer is 6 by 11 versus a 9 by 10 uh, for a flyback that might be operating at 400 kilohertz or so. And so in terms of total solution size, uh, we're able to come about 40% smaller compared to a flyback. And then if you look at the number of external components as well, uh, for this LLC, we only require 21 uh, versus 26 uh, for a competitor flyback solution. So we have about 20% less external components as well. Uh, one great thing about reducing solution size is it does result in lower solution cost as well. Uh, so if we look at a bomb cost, so bill of material cost analysis with all the external components of an LLC resident topology versus a, PSR, a primary side regulated flyback, for example, uh, for the high voltage caps, uh, the 18 mile through will be slightly higher. We need about 12 microfarads versus approximately 5 microfarads for a PSR flyback. However, uh, we need much less low voltage caps, so we will need about 2 microfarads versus close to 64 microfarads uh, for a PSR flyback. Uh, we don't need any sort of Zener diodes or switching diodes that you might need with a flyback. And then uh, due to the higher switching frequency, we can achieve a much cheaper transformer cost as well uh, with a smaller transformer. And so in total, our bomb cost is almost 50% lower uh, compared to a PSR flyback. So the bomb cost here is the cost for all the external components, excluding the cost of the IC itself. And then the cost of this uh, LLC resident IC, the MPQ18913, uh, is actually very similar to how much a flyback converter IC would cost. And then here on the bottom, you can see our cost assumptions. Uh, so for low voltage caps, we're assuming about 5 cents for 10 microfarads. Whereas for high voltage caps, we're assuming 10 cents for 10 microfarads. We've also done a solution size comparison of our MPQ18913, which is our discrete LLC supply versus the MID1W2424, which is a, uh, the isolated power module with integrated transformer. Um, so if you look at the total area in the X and Y dimension, actually the discrete solution is slightly smaller at 120 millimeter squared versus 150 millimeter squared. Uh, for the MID1W2424 power module. Um, the biggest difference that you will see is in the max height of the total solution. Uh, so with the discrete component and um, an external transformer, that transformer might be nine millimeters tall, whereas for the MID1W2424, uh, because it's all integrated in an SOIC16 wide body package, that height is only 2.65 millimeters. So if you have very tight restrictions in the Z dimension, uh, you should definitely take a look at the MID1W2424 solution from MPS. So if we take a look at uh, the overall comparison of this uh, LLC resident topology versus a flyback. Uh, so obviously uh, with an LLC, you can go up to 10 megahertz with our solution, whereas for a flyback, you're uh, left at 400 kilohertz or less. The transformer size uh, for an LLC is 13 microhenry due to the higher switching frequency, whereas it's around 30 microhenry for a flyback topology. Um, in an LLC, the leakage inductance is actually used as part of the resonant tank, which is a benefit. And then in a PSR flyback, uh, leakage inductance actually causes extra voltage spikes and extra losses. Um, the real big advantage is as you go up to 800 volt uh, backplanes, 
uh, we are able to achieve a much higher isolation voltage. So we can achieve up to 5 kV while really minimizing the amount of interwinding capacitance that's required. Uh, so for an LLC topology, we can achieve 5 kV while keeping the isolation capacitance at 6 picofarads. Uh, for PSR flyback, anything above 2.5 kV isolation uh, becomes a little tougher to manage. And then uh, the isolation capacitance on a flyback might be 13 picofarads, as high as even 40 picofarads um, in some cases, which can cause extra voltage spikes. Uh, an LLC is a soft switching topology, so you do get much better EMI performance. And I'll have a few more slides on that later on uh, compared to flyback, which is hard switching, and you get a little bit of overshoot on the switch node. Um, on the package size, we are smaller with this LLC at, in a 2 by 2.5 millimeter package whereas a PSR flyback is generally around four by four millimeters. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are able to achieve about a 40% smaller total solution size and 50% smaller solution cost. So ne next we'll uh, talk about designing an LLC uh, gate driver power supply and uh, the ins and outs of that. Um, so if we look at isolated gate drivers, they are a key part of power converters and they help by activating uh, switches to help drive the power conversion. Um, so these gate drivers generally take a control signal from the primary or uh, low voltage side, and then it turns on and off a power switch on the secondary side or high voltage side by either sourcing or sinking current to the gate of those power switches. And so this really helps to provide an isolation barrier between both the high voltage side and the low voltage sides of a design. Um, so one thing we do notice here is that for these gate drivers, we do need an isolated power source on the secondary side, uh, which is uh, illustrated by the VDD on this diagram. Um, and so here, uh, circled in red, uh, we have our isolated power supply. It takes the input voltage from the primary side and actually generates the isolated output voltage on the secondary side. Um, so there is an isolation barrier that has to be present between the primary and secondary side inside the power supply. And this is generally provided uh, by a transformer that's used. Uh, so in the EV industry today, we are seeing some interesting trends that put uh, the requirements on the uh, more requirements on the transformer design for these isolated power supplies. So the battery voltage and the DC bus voltage has been gradually transforming from 400 volts up to 800 volts. And I've even seen uh, some designs where uh, we're using 1000 or 1200 volts uh, for the battery voltage. And so in order to really facilitate higher power density uh, traction drives and to boost up um, the overall drivetrain efficiency, uh, that's why they're increasing this voltage. Um, the one thing with the 800 volt DC bus is that you do need a transformer that can withstand a higher isolation voltage. Um, secondly, the industry is also gradually shifting from silicon IGBTs to silicon carbide MOSFETs in their converter designs. And this is really to help take advantage of high speed and low loss features of silicon carbide devices. Um, the one thing is, as you switch faster, you get a higher DVDT. Um, operation. And so that drives a lot more current uh, across the isolation barrier compared to IGBTs. And this noisy current can actually disturb the normal operation of either controllers or sensitive circuits on the low voltage side. And that's why we really need to minimize uh, the amount of interwinding or isolation capacitance of the transformer as much as possible. Uh, so in the design example here below, uh, if we have a 20 picofarad uh, capacitor um, and assuming a slew rate of 100 volts per nanosecond, uh, the common mode current that we'll get across the isolation boundary will be one amp. And so that can be very disruptive to MCUs, uh, gate driver ICs, or even the gate driver power supply. So then the question comes, how can we deal with this new requirement uh, for the transformers? Um, so if you think about interwinding capacitance, uh, you can compare that to a parallel plate capacitor. And since the insulation material and area of the coil offers less design freedom, uh, the best way to reduce this capacitor is actually by separating the two windings, which increases uh, the thickness of the insulation layer. And so as we can see from the equation on the top right here, uh, this capacitance is inversely proportional to the distance between the two winding coils. And so we actually need to increase this distance to reduce the capacitance. And so when we increase the distance, it also increases the isolation distance, which helps increase the isolation voltage possible. There is a cost to increasing the isolation distance uh, from the windings, though. Uh, so when we increase the insulation thickness, this actually reduces the interwinding capacitance, um, but it worsens the magnetic coupling between the two sets of windings, which causes extra leakage inductance. And so uh, you really have to 
figure out a way to deal with this unavoidably large uh, leakage inductor as you increase uh, the amount of uh, isolation. So one of the most frequently used topologies we have uh, for these applications is a flyback converter. Uh, so a flyback converter typically behaves similar to a buck boost, uh, but you have a split inductor um, to enable isolation between the input and output. So in these converters, efficiency is actually very uh, closely linked to how tightly the primary and secondary inductors are coupled. Um, and so when you increase uh, the leakage inductance, this loosens the coupling, so then the amount of energy which is transferred across the inductor will decrease, and this could, will cause a large loss in efficiency. And so uh, typically the design trade-offs we're making are to select larger and more expensive components that can uh, accommodate this voltage spike, which is created by the leakage inductor's resonance. And so for this reason, the flyback converter aren't exactly the most ideal solution uh, for high power designs. Uh, so just to illustrate a little bit more on how a flyback converter operates, uh, when the switch turns on, the current will flow through the switch as well as uh, the leakage inductance. And when the switch is turned off, some power will be stored in the magnetizing inductance will be transferred to the secondary side and hence to the output. Uh, the energy stored in the leakage inductance has to find a way to flow somewhere, and that will cause resonance between the leakage inductance and the output capacitance of the switch. And so this results in high voltage spikes um, across the switch. And so that's really what's causing these uh, switch mode uh, voltage spikes um, that keep increasing. And the larger uh, the voltage spikes we have here, uh, you know, we get more complicated snubber design and we generate losses and noises, uh, which limit the max operating frequency. And so the larger the leakage we have, uh, the worse the performance of the flyback. And so that's kind of why uh, we started developing um, LLC converters. Uh, which we believe to be the most efficient topology for isolated gate driver power supplies. Uh, so these converters are actually based on a resonant LLC tank. So you see here, uh, we have two inductors plus the capacitor. And so this has a magnetizing inductor for energy transfer, as well as an additional capacitor and inductor whose purpose is to make the tank resonate at a certain frequency. Um, so the converter really uses this resonant resonance to ensure highly efficient power conversion. And the main benefit of an LLC um, is that the leakage inductance created by the transformer can be used as the resonant inductor in the tank, which eliminates the issue of efficiency loss or voltage spikes associated with the flyback topology. And this is why we really believe LLC converters are the best choice uh, for powering isolated gate drivers. Uh, so now we'll go through a sample design uh, for biasing silicon carbide FETs. Um, so here in the middle of the screen, we have a block diagram. Um, if we do, for most LLCs, because they're unregulated on the output, we do require a regulated input. So in this case, uh, we have a input of 12 volts, and then we're boosting it to 29 volts uh, for the LLC. And so in this diagram, um, yeah, so if you have a, if you, if you have a 12 volt input off a car battery, for example, uh, we would want to boost it up to 24 volts. And as long as it's not regulated, uh, we do generally uh, look for a boost on the input. Um, so in this diagram, we're using one LLCIC to drive one transformer that has three output windings. And so here uh, with MPQ18913, we have a triple output winding transformer. And so this is able to bias um, three different silicon carbide FETs. Um, and generally, it's more common to use this uh, on the low side for the low side FETs uh, to power three. And then on the high side, generally, we have about one LLC power supply for each uh, silicon carbide FET. Um, so in this design, we do use a transformer bobbin with two slots, which helps separate the primary and secondary windings to achieve the highest isolation voltage while really minimizing uh, the isolation capacitance. And so in this design, we're actually able to achieve an interwinding capacitance of less than one picofarad. Um, so if we look at the performance of a boot boost controller on the front end, as well as the MPQ18913, um, we're able to achieve pretty good load regulation of 1.5% or less on all three outputs, even at full load. And we're also achieving uh, above 75% efficiency at a five watt load uh, with this design. So this is a comparison of uh, a switch node waveform of a flyback 
versus the LLC topology. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have our LLC. Uh, you can see on the switch node, um, it's a very clean switch node. There's no overshoot at all. Whereas on the right-hand side uh, with the flyback, we do have quite a bit of uh, overshoot and ringing, uh, which is really difficult to filter out. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that um, our LLC is a soft switching topology, whereas a flyback is a hard switching topology. And so here on the left, um, I'm showing the input waveform of the LLC topology. As you can see, uh, the input waveform shows very little noise, only a little bit of voltage ripples. And then if you look at uh, the flyback design on the right-hand side, the input voltage waveform actually shows a great amount of uh, voltage ringing and noise, which can really pollute uh, the input voltage rail. So thanks for taking the time to learn about how a resonant LLC transformer driver functions and taking a look at um, a design example to be able to achieve 5 kV isolation while biasing three different silicon carbide FETs. Uh, MPS is heavily invested in the electrification market with innovative solutions for onboard chargers, traction inverters, as well as for DC fast charging stations with different products, including isolated gate drivers, digital isolators, uh, isolated power modules with integrated transformers, um, especially ones that are based off an LLC topology as a gate driver power supply. Uh, we do believe that resident LLC supplies are a great way for biasing either IGBTs or silicon carbide FETs to really help increase uh, power density and next generation charging station designs over traditional flyback with better performance as well as space and cost savings in the designs itself. Um, so keep looking out for new products from MPS as we continue to invest in isolated and high power products that will continue to push electrification designs forward to achieve higher efficiency, higher power density and smaller solution size. We are really excited uh, by the possibilities in the electrification market as adoption of electric vehicles has been increasing at an exponential rate worldwide, uh, driven by regulations to achieve carbon neutrality. Um, so I'd like to thank you for joining this Charging Station Solutions webinar, and I look forward to future events together. Um, thanks for taking the time to watch and learn more about designing an LLC power supply, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks, George. Lots of good information today. Uh, again, we will open it up now for uh, questions that you might have. We do have a couple in, but for those of you who might not have been here at the very beginning, you can simply mouse over your Zoom webinar interface. There's a Q&A button. Pop that open and type in your questions. Uh, our number one question is typically, is this uh, presentation going to be available after the fact? And yes, we are recording this. You can always find our presentations at monolithicpower.com forward slash webinars. But since all of you are registered, we will be sending an email within the next couple of days. Um, so you can review both the presentation and the video. Uh, so with that, we do have a couple questions. This one, George, was fairly early in the presentation. Can you explain auto resonant detection features of the MPQ18913? Yeah, so for the MPQ18913, um, on startup of uh, your circuit, um, it will automatically detect what the resonant frequency is in the circuit, and then it sets that uh, as, as the resonant frequency. Um, so if you see here, we do have this detection pin on the IC, uh, DET. And so basically on startup, it just looks for what uh, the resonant frequency of um, the circuit is, and it uses that as the resonant frequency detection point. Um, so on startup, every single time this IC starts, uh, that's when the automatic resonant frequency detection kicks in. Um, so it's not really able to monitor live if the resonant frequency changes, for example, um, but on startup is when it determines what the resonant frequency detection will be. Great, thanks, George. Uh, next one was... What kinds of tests have been done to verify the 5K volt RMS isolation capability? Yeah, so for the isolation voltages, uh, we, do, we do a high pot test. Um, so we, you know, we, do, um, we do temperature cycling. Uh, you know, after a thousand temperature cycles, we check again to see if we're still able to achieve a 5 kV isolation. And then if you look at a lot of our isolated gate drivers and other digital isolator products, uh, we do have certifications from uh, UL and VDE, and they have some pretty severe isolation tests as well to help verify 
um, the isolation capability of our devices. Um, so yeah, we do have a lot of tests that we do, you know, a thousand hours, high temperature over lifetime, and then um, just testing to make sure that after the high temperature testing and all the cycles that the isolation barrier hasn't broken down um, and that we're still able to meet uh, that isolation specification. Great, thanks. And it looked like maybe there's a Tommy that, that had a question they wanted to raise, but I don't see anything typed in there. So uh, if you do have a question that you want, oh, here it is. Uh, let's see. He says, I'm really interested in this LLC gate driver power supply. Most of the SIC manufacturer recommend a, uh, a plus 18 to three volt for a gate driver. Can we tune it to meet this requirement? Yeah, uh, so for the 18913, uh, we do have an input voltage range from five volt to 30 volt up to 50 volts. Um, so if you need to drive plus 18 minus three volts uh, for a silicon carbide, for example, um, it just depends on the input voltage you put on this device. And then uh, depending on the design of the transformer, uh, you can really optimize it for plus 18, minus three, whatever voltage uh, that you need. Um, typically we see, you know, you put a 24 volt input and then we could get a plus eight, 18, minus three. Uh, and then you might need some LDOs on the output as well uh, for that voltage drop. All right, thanks, George. Next up. Uh, is it possible to drive a resonant tank with split capacitors on the rails? Hey, uh, Kelly, can you uh, can you let uh, D also be a panelist? He's on the line right now, and he can answer the question about uh, driving a resonant tank with split capacitors on the rails. All right, D, I th think we. We've got you across. So if you want to take a crack at this one, D. Yeah, um, the quick answer is yes. Uh, so by split, splitting the resonant capacitor, essentially you are uh, having two capacitor, one from uh, switch, one from the um, Bit one is connecting to the ground, the other is connecting to the uh, input rail, right? That, that's how we can split it. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, any final questions? We'll pause here for just a second to see if any more come in. The, one of the early questions was on the automatic resident uh, detection feature of the MPQ-18913. I mentioned that on startup, uh, we detect the resonant frequency uh, of, of the circuit. And then that's basically what we use as the uh, resonant frequency point. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that at all? Yeah, that's exactly what we do. Okay. Yeah, we during startup, we generate the step rising edge, right? Then we observe the tank of, uh, oscillate by itself. and capture was the oscillating frequency. Then that, that frequency is the resonant frequency. Uh, with some, let's see, could there, and this was a follow-up to the prior one, um, could there be driven several transformers on, on the, one HP switches. Hopefully you guys understand that one. Yeah, I think the question is, can it drive a transformer with multiple upper windings or can it drive multiple transformers? Yeah, either way, it's, it's fine, yeah. We actually have reverend designs that, that does that. All right, so I, I think that one addressed it. We got a, a yes in there from Matthias. Uh, and then there was, I think, a follow-up from the prior one. And it's just, initially, it starts at high frequency. So hopefully, we can associate that with the past answer. That's uh, that's addressed to the automatic resonant frequency detection question, D. Yeah. They asked if it initially it starts at high frequency. Yeah, initially, 
Uh, so, so during the detection phase, it's just a quick falling edge. Actually, it's, it's doing on the falling edge. So we 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 have a falling edge on the SW, which is very quick, right? It's more. It, it's like uh, observing the step response of the tank. Um, does that answer the question? So after we observe the uh, oscillation frequency of the tank, then we know what's the resonant point. But during startup, we start at an even higher frequency, right? Then the resonant frequency. Then we, because we want to limit the inrush current, then we gradually decrease the switching frequency to the resonant point. Some noise in the background here. We are doing a little bit of construction in the area, uh, but I am not seeing any other questions. We did thank you, got it on that last one. So I think we addressed that one pretty well. Um, so with that, I think we are complete for today. Again, we thank you for attending and look forward to having you at future sessions. <laughs>